Alright, ladies, good evening. Um, I know I'm starting really, really late, but um, I apologize about that. I'm not sure who's going to watch this live or who's going to catch this later, but I totally just haven't been having a good Friday. Um, so yeah, I overslept. And then <clears throat> Thursday was a very stressful day for my family and I. So... Yeah, um, I might switch up and start doing evening Bible studies if I do them on Fridays, possibly. I'm not sure yet. Um, the mornings work fine for me, but I might try switching up into the evenings. Hi, Jeanette. But, um, yeah. So, I'm going to quickly run through the supplies that I use for those of you who are new to the group or who are new to watching on the YouTube channel. And then I'm going to do a quick prayer and we're going to dive right in. There are only 21 verses. It shouldn't be that long. Hopefully normally the normally these sessions are an hour and a half an hour. I'm hoping to keep it at an hour. So quickly, the Bible that I'm using for this month is the ESV single column journaling Bible from Crossway. Um I do like this translation. It's a really really good translation and it's really easy to understand. But personally, for myself, I prefer to use the um, New King James. But this is the last month that I'll be using this translation during these Bible study sessions. Um, I do have my notes, which are on chapter 3, which you can get from the blog. It's basically 30 pages of notes on Ephesians that I typed out with cross-references, definitions, and everything. Um, for $10 on the blog if you want. Um, what else? The pen that I'm going to be using, which I need to switch my pen actually, because I'm not sure if you guys can see here, but it's completely bleeding through. So the pen I was using was the, um, big round stick and the fine point, but I find that this pen is just bleeding through the pages and I'm not liking that. So I'm actually going to switch my pen right now. If I could find it. Alright, so I'm just going to go back to the Micron. I'm just going to have to invest in a, um, a blue Micron. But I'm going to be using the black Pigma Micron, or yeah, Pigma Micron 01 Archival Ink. This is in the 0.25 millimeter. And that's what the tip looks like. But I'm just going to go back to this because this does not bleed through as bad as this. And this, I don't know, down here it's like really bleeding through and I don't like that. Oh my god, it's like, uh, I don't like that. So I'm going to be switching to this pen for the duration of this Bible study unless I can get my hands on a blue one. But um, yeah, black. Hopefully you guys can see this. Um, then we have the... Crayola Twistable Pencils that I'm using. Um, I like these as highlighters because they're pencils and they highlight really well. Sharpie Smear Guard highlighters. I use the ones without the clip. I'm not sure how the accent ones work, but I do prefer their regular ones that are Smear Guard. Um, the Crayola Super Tip Markers. These are really, really great and um, affordable to use as highlighters in your Bible. They don't really bleed through as much. And um, they do a really good job, especially if you use like the light pastel-y colors. They're really great. And then my new loves, which are the Zebra Mild Liner, Fine Liner, Double Ended Highlighters. They have a fine liner tip on one end and a chisel bold tip on the other. So that is that. Hopefully my family will remain quiet so I can record this video for you all. And I am going to start off with a quick prayer, just inviting the Holy Spirit in as we dive in. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight just to say thank you. Thank you for giving us another day to walk among the living, Father God. I'm asking that you enter into this Bible study and just bring your Holy Spirit so that we may be able to understand and get what, what it is that you would have us to get from this study, Lord. I am asking that you decrease Allow me to de decrease of myself that way you are to increase within me, Father God. I'm asking that we come to an understanding of your word and that we are able to take something from this chapter and apply it to our everyday lives. Amen. So, hi, Christine. <laughs> Just a quick prayer. And, oh yeah, the last thing I forgot to mention were post-it notes, but 
yeah i'm using the same post-it notes for the book of ephesians i don't want to um mix it up but yeah so for those who are new to the group or who are new to my channel or bible study in general um i do bible studying in a very different type of way i break it down by paragraph or by chapter in this case i would probably do it section by section but i'm gonna do paragraph by paragraph so basically i would read the paragraph first and then I would go in and circle words that I want to define. After I do that, I would obviously define those words. Once I define the words, whether I know them and I, or I don't know them, I then go in and underline parts of the verses that really stand out to me and take notes. And once I have my notes down, I box everything, make arrows, and then I add color because color just makes everything better and whatnot. So I'm going to start off with verses 1 through 6. Again, this is the ESV translation. Hopefully you guys can see this. Let me make sure. Okay. So this is called the mystery of the gospel revealed. Hopefully, you know, you're not going to see that, but hopefully you guys can see that right there. So I'm going to drive, dive right in. Verse 1, chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Hi, Tanya. So, I just read that. So, now what I'm going to do is go and circle. Now, what I did so that this is not a super long study because it is late, um, I did already write all of the definitions down on my little post-it note already. Um, as you can see, I wrote them all down. I just have to add the colors once I circle. But, um, okay, so the first word I'm going to circle is prisoner. The next word I'm going to circle is stewardship. And the last words are going to be in verse 6, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, verse 6. So it's going to be fellow heirs, which is two words. But in the Greek um, definition, for some reason, it's one word together. So um, fellow heirs, same body as one word as well. And I believe the final word is going to be partakers. So I have circled prisoner, stewardship, fellow heirs, same body, and partakers. And as I said, I already wrote the definition, so I'm just going to pick some colors quickly and then show you guys the definitions. And I'm using the zebra mile liners right now. So, let me show you guys the actual note. So, prisoner, if you guys can see here, the Greek word for that is right here. But um, in Greek, it basically means being bound to something or someone. Stewardship, I totally did not realize that I didn't put the actual definition down. So, I wrote it on my paper. So, um, here is the Greek word. But it means office of administrator and trusted by God dispensation slash arrangement by which the grace of God was granted then we have fellow heirs here's the Greek word and that just basically means co-inheritor or joint heir same body Greek word is here and it means belonging to the same church and partakers this is the Greek word and it just means together with one or co-participants so I'm just going to go back in with my colors and um, make sure that these match up.
that done. So now we're going to go in and underline. So starting off with verse 1, I have a prisoner of Christ that I'm going to underline. Is my pen dying? That would suck. Okay. Yeah, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And um, the reason I underline that is because he may have been a prisoner in Rome and at this time he was a prisoner um, in Rome. But he also understood that he was bound to Christ in the way that no cell could live up to. He was basically um, saying that he was chained to Christ and the word of God rather than chained inside of this jail cell that he was in. So I'm going to write that here. Uh may have been a prisoner but he understood he was bound to Christ Um, there's actually a song by, I think his name is Dion Kipping, called Prisoner of Christ that I love to dance to anytime I have to minister and dance at church. Um, because that song is so powerful and it just reminds me of Paul, because Paul always said that he was a prisoner of Christ no matter um, what situation he was in or what jail cell he was in. So I just, I love the song and I just think of it every time I think of Paul. I hate this pen, oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, let's try to find another pen. I don't know what it is with the micron now. It's starting to irritate me. I'm going to go in with my zebra instead. <laughs> this is the zebra G301 gel pen. Um, I'm not sure if I should actually use it. Oh god, hold on. Nope. Okay, I'm not gonna use it. It's a gel pen. Pay me no mind, guys. I just, I guess, I haven't used the micron in forever, so it's kind of weird writing with it now just gonna we're gonna rock with it um going on to verse three it says how the mystery was made known to me by revelation so basically um paul is letting the people know that he is not using his own understanding but that god revealed it to him making him a messenger of truth um and to know or be made known of something it must be revealed to you by the one who knows and the only one who knows is christ jesus by way of god so this is letting us know that he's not depending on himself or his own thoughts even in his current situation um it is god who has revealed it to him and who is making him a messenger of truth for the gentiles mm. I don't know where I'm going to write that at. I'm just going to write it on the post it. So I'm going to do verse 3. And I'm going to say Paul letting people know. That he is not using his own understanding but that God revealed it to him. I'm going to go in with this super tips. I just messed up. Oh gosh. <laughs> I know something was weird. Okay. Okay. 
Going to verse 6, it says this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body. And partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So I just broke that one verse into two parts because it has a double kind of meaning to me. Okay, so that first part Which brand, Brittany? The Pigma Micron or the Zebra? I'm going to use a Zebra on the post-it note and then the Pigma inside of the Bible because, yeah. It's just easier to write with the Zebra. But, um, okay, so this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body. Basically, is that the mystery, um, the mystery is that Jews and Gentiles that believe are now joined together as one. There is no longer a separation. So that's the mystery. And you can read that in Galatians 3 and 28. So. Mystery revealed is that there is no longer And if you see me do a circle with a slash through it, that just means no. I learned that in debate when we had the shorthand. <laughs> so um, that there is no longer. Oopsie. Separation. Between. Jews and Gentiles. And again, you can read Galatians. What is it? 3 and 28 for that. Which is a cross reference. And then the second portion that says, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, basically is saying that Jesus' sacrifice opened up the promise and possibility to Gentiles. They were now converted into spiritual heirs and that the gospel is universal. It is a privilege that the promise is no longer just reserved for Jewish believers alone. And you can read um, Galatians 3 and 29 for that. Yeah, the microns are really good. I just, I don't like the... Um, the tip of them for some reason they're I don't know they're like I don't know I don't know how to explain it the tips are very sharp so it's kind of like hard for me to write with them after I stop using them for a minute so it takes me some time to get back into the habit of using them I do like them though I definitely want to get my hands on um their bible study kit because they do have some of the micron pens that are good for bible study so I do want to get my hands on some of those but um so for the second portion where it says partakers of promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, I'm going to write that the gospel is universal. And I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. So the gospel is universal. Jesus is sacrifice. Open promise and possibility to Gentiles. And again, that is Galatians 3 and 29 that you can read for that cross reference. So now we're going to move on to verses 7 to 13. I'm going to read that through. Hi, Angela. So starting at verse 7, it says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am very... 
I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone that in verse 9 and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God may know be might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord verse 12 in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for for you which is your glory so I'm going to circle words and I'm going to start off with verse 8 I'm going to circle unsearchable I'm going to go to verse 10 and circle manifold. Going to verse 12, I have, I think I have a few words for verse 12. I have boldness, access, and confidence. So for this paragraph, I have unsearchable, which is in verse 8, manifold, which is in verse 10, and then in verse 12, I have boldness, access, and confidence circled. Hey, Latoya. And again, I already wrote those definitions down so that this would not be a long evening, but um, I will share with you guys exactly what I wrote. I'm just going to add my color. Okay, so sharing with you guys the definitions. Um, unsearchable here is the Greek word for that. And um, it basically means cannot be traced out or explored and it's incomprehensible. Manifold, here's the Greek word for that. And it means much varied, manifesting itself in a great variety of forms. Boldness. That is the Greek word, and it means freedom of speech, undoubting confidence of fellowship with God. Moving on to access, here is the Greek word for that. And it basically means the act of bringing to, it, the act of bringing to, admission to, friendly relation with God, whereby we are acceptable to him and have assurance that he is favorably disposed toward us. And the last one is confidence. That's the Greek word, and it just means to trust or have reliance in. All right, so verse 7, I'm going to underline where it says, According to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. And basically, Paul is a minister of the gospel by God's grace and power. Our spiritual gifts come from God and are not of ourselves. So it's just a reminder that um, whether you're gifted in preaching, if you're gifted in teaching. Um, hi, Angela. <laughs> so if you're gifted in preaching, teaching, ministering, um, if you're an usher in the church, if you're a deacon in the church, if you're an elder, uh, if you're working in administration, if you're helping clean up the church, like whatever you're gifted, be it big or small. It all comes from God, and it has nothing to do with you. You are to use that gift, utilize it um, for the purpose of the gospel. So that's just what Paul is saying, or at least rather what I'm gathering that he is saying after I've studied it, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so let's get color. I'm going to use blue.
Let's write that on the post-it. So verse 7. I'm going to say Paul is a minister. of the gospel by God's grace and power our gifts come from God and are not of ourselves and I have three cross references for that. So the first one is going to be Romans 1 and 5. Romans 15 and 18. And then the last one is Hebrews 2 and 9. So you guys can definitely just um, read that. Hope you guys can see this. Hey, Tasha. So again, for verse 7, where it says, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the by the working of his power, Paul is a minister of the gospel by God's grace and power, and that our gifts come from God and are not of ourselves. The cross references are going to be Romans 1 and 5, Romans 15, 18, and Hebrews 2, 9. Moving to verse 8. It says, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. And basically, Paul here is just marveling at the grace of God, um, especially considering his personal history, obviously trying, um, not trying, but obviously killing uh the Jews and whatnot. He was one of those. I don't. I don't know. Like I don't know how to explain it. But he was one of those people who just killed his own kind, um, because he thought he was doing it for the gospel that made sense to him instead of what the actual gospel was. So at this point, he's just marveling and um, humbling himself before God. So I'm going to use this color. And um, this is also a reminder that Jesus covers our humanity with humility. And you can read 1 Corinthians 15 and 9 for that. But um, So I'm going to write that Paul marvels at God's grace considering his past. Jesus covers our humanity with humility. And for that, it's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. Okay. So going to verse 9, it says, To bring to light for everyone that is in the plan of the mystery hidden. what I'm going to underline and it basically says that we are to share basically means that we are to share the gospel together and make it known to all um, once God reveals it to us so if God reveals something to you 
um, and it's not like on a personal level, it's definitely not for you to just keep it to yourself, um, especially if it can help someone else. It is meant for you to reveal whatever was revealed to you to the next person. And I'm hoping I'm making sense. I don't mean if he reveals like something personal. Yes, Tanya. Yeah, he definitely was a sinner with all he did. But um, I don't mean that if, you know, you're praying for something and he reveals something that's like extremely personal to you, you, you don't need to reveal that to anyone. But what I mean is um, if you know, like if you meet someone who's stumbling um, across a problem or situation that God helped you through, you can always help that person by revealing um, whatever God, whatever the gospel is to them and it doesn't have to be your personal it's hard to under like explain i hope you guys are understanding what i'm saying when i say that um because i know someone is going to be like oh my god well i don't want to share something personal it's not that you have to share anything personal it's just that your testimony basically can help somebody um what god reveals to you can help someone but you don't have to be so deep about it if that makes sense I, I think that's the best way for me to explain it um share the gospel but you don't have to always be so deep about it so i'm going to write um Share the gospel. Make it known to all once God reveals it. And then in verse 10, it says, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. Basically, um, God's wisdom is infinite and he seeks to reveal it to each of us. And you can go to 1 Timothy 3 and 16 for that cross reference. But um, there's not just one limited way that his wisdom can be revealed there are many ways that his wisdom can be revealed and he's always seeking a way for us to understand it in our own personal way so verse 10 his wisdom is infinite he seeks to Reveal it to each of us. And again, the cross reference for that is First Timothy three and sixteen. And then it goes in to say that to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So basically, um, God will reveal his wisdom by his work in the church and to the angelic beings. God teaches the angelic beings through us. Um, and you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 11, 10, 1 Peter 1 and 12, and in 1 Timothy 5 and 21. So, I'm going to say God will reveal... His wisdom by his work to angelic beings, which are angels. <laughs> um, and again, that's First Corinthians. 
11, 10. First Peter 1 and 12 and First Timothy 5, 21. Gonna move those notes to the side for now. Verse 11, it says, The eternal purpose that he has realized in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus our Lord, sorry. The eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, basically, the mystery reveals and is. Okay, so basically that the mystery is revealed in that it's for, it furthers God's eternal purpose in Jesus, which is basically gathering all things in him, under him, um, and giving Jesus just all authority over everything. So, I'm actually going to write that over here. I'm going to say revealed through Jesus and brings all things in him. And the cross references are going to be First Peter one and twenty and then first John three and eight Hi, Lisa. My pillow fall. Oh, okay. So that is that. And then the last verse. Um, no, not the last one. <laughs> um, it says, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So basically, because of our faith in God, through his son, Jesus Christ, who is our savior, we can be certain that we have freedom and a way of getting near to enter into God's presence, um, to pray to him and to enjoy him. Many people think that they can pray to God just because they believe in God, but not his son. But it's just impossible. Everything must go through um, Christ Jesus. I mean, he is literally the doorway to God. So if you don't believe in Christ, but you're praying, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, you know, that that works. I don't I don't know how that works, because in order for you to have a relationship with God, you have to have a relationship with his son. So um, the cross references, I have so many cross references. So I'm only going to probably do like three of them because there are so many here that I wrote down. Um, so you guys can read Second Corinthians three and four. First Timothy three and thirteen, um, Hebrews ten nineteen, and you can also read First John two and twenty eight. I just say like I, I'm I'm staring at all of these cross references, but um let me just let me just write my note over here on the side. Um so. Because of faith, can be certain that we have freedom. And a way of getting 
into God's presence to pray and to enjoy him. Then I said it's going to be 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. First Timothy three thirteen Hebrews ten nineteen and then I don't remember which one of first John I said, so hopefully these match up, but if not, I have two cross references for first John, so I'm just gonna say two and twenty eight. Hopefully that's the one I said. If not, then you have both. <laughs> Yeah, because I have how many? One, two, three, four, five. I have six cross references written down, so I think I only just put four here. Um, but. Let's use this gray color. I'm like obsessed with gray highlighters, they're so pretty. And then lastly, um, it says not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Basically, Paul doesn't want the believers to be discouraged because he knew his suffering was for a purpose. Um, and it was being used in full service of God's eternal plan. So when you suffer, um, a lot of the time people... I know when I... I when I see someone suffering, I don't like it. Um, it. It breaks my heart to see someone suffer. But here Paul is basically saying that suffering has a specific purpose and that purpose is um, to be used in full service of God's eternal plan. And, um, you know, we all know sometimes God ways don't make no sense. Um, sometimes I question. I'm currently in like a questioning stage with everything that's going on in my family. But, um, you know, that suffering is meant for a purpose and even though I might not see the purpose right now, I know that it is all going to be for um, God's plan for myself, for my mother, for my family in general. So, um, you know, we all hate to see people suffer, but sometimes suffering has its purpose for God's work. Now, I'm not saying it's always God's work, but, um, you know, suffering does have a purpose. So I'm going to write suffering has a purpose in God's plan. Let's use this pink. I feel like being extra bright with this one. Okay. All right, let's move on to the last paragraph. I'm just gonna combine the last few verses cause it doesn't make sense not to combine them. <laughs> so let me move these notes out of the way. Nope, sorry, let me go back and um, make sure my colors are there on my notes so verse 9 I did in green was it this green I don't know but I'm gonna use this one who knows verse 10 I did in brown right brown and orange all right now we're working with it now we're good Put that to the side. And I'm going to finally read the last paragraph, which is going to be verses 14 to 21. Um, again, I am sorry about this bleed through. This is terrible. Like, I don't mind bleed through, but this is like really terrible bleed through. Like, that 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 is disgusting to me. I don't like that, but so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but um, anyway, this last part is um a prayer for spiritual strength, and this is 
it's, it's something about the book of Ephesians with their prayers. I love writing out the prayers and personalizing them, personalizing them um, and putting my name or putting the name of whoever I'm praying for. Um, and I just think this is such a good prayer to write out and pray over yourself and for everyone else for spiritual strength. I just think it's amazing. But I'm going to read it through. So verse 14, it says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all full, with all the fullness of God. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever. Amen. So, you know, actually, I'll get into that after we um, break this down. But moving my coffee to the side because it's all in my way. I think I need to invest in a much larger desk, um, folding desk. Going to look into that. First, we're going to define some words. Um, and I only have four here, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, four. So the first one is going to be in verse 17. And I'm just going to circle the word dwell. Um, rooted. And grounded. And the last one is in verse 19, and that's just going to um, be surpasses. So that's it. So as well, I'm going to use green. Rooted will be yellow, I mean pink. Because clearly I don't know my colors. <laughs> I will use yellow. <laughs> for grounded. And surpasses. Will be in orange. Alright. And I'm going to share with you guys those definitions. So, dwell, here is the Greek word for that, and it means to reside, live, or settle within the soul, to prompt, govern, or guide it. Rooted, the Greek word is here, and it just means to render firm, to fix, or to establish. Grounded, this is the Greek word here, and it means to make stable or to settle. And then surpasses. That's the Greek word, and it basically means to transcend, exceed, or excel beyond the mark. And again, I have my definitions here. I wrote them out ahead of time so that it wouldn't take me 30 hours to um, do this. <laughs> so, starting with verse 16, we're going to start off breaking down verse 16. Um, he says that strengthen with power through his spirit in your inner being. So be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Hopefully you guys can see this. Um, and basically, um, strength for our inner being comes from the Holy Spirit alone. We cannot receive strength or power from another source. Um, there's only really one true source of strength, and that strength comes from God. But um, God gave us a, a direct kind of source that's already built within, built within us. That's probably not the right way to say it, but um, he gave us something that is a source of of everything that we need though our source is God he gave us someone as Christ said that would um, be that source so the Holy Spirit if you have the Holy Spirit that dwells within you you have a source of strength within you but you just need to activate that source so um, where's my paper verse 16 
I'm going to say um, strength for the inner being. And the inner being being your soul, your, your spirit. <laughs> so strength for the inner being comes from the Holy Spirit alone. And you, uh, again, I have several cross references. I'm probably just going to do three. So you can read Romans 7.22. Colossians 1 and 11, and then also 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5. So again, strength for your inner being comes from the Holy Spirit alone. We cannot receive strength or power from another source. And I know sometimes I do. I try to get strength from like, I don't know, from coffee or <laughs> I might try to sleep a little extra to get a little bit of strength in me, but realistically that doesn't give me strength. The only way that I find that I get true strength that really does sustain me is when I'm praying, when I'm asking the Holy Spirit to to um to to move on me, when I'm asking God to, you know, give me strength. Um there's really only way to get true strength. And I mean strength that will actually last and sustain you, not that quick 10 minute strength that coffee can give you or a quick 20 minute nap can give you because I mean you know you can get a little bit of strength after you take a nap <laughs> but um true strength comes from the father above alone like that's it so moving to verse 17 he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith I'm going to underline that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then he also says being rooted and grounded in love. Before I go further, I need color. So I'm going to use orange here, even though I use that color already, but who cares? Okay, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Um, Jesus should live in each of us as believers, um, which can only be done by our faith. So you can't say you believe in Jesus, but don't have faith. And um, you can't say you have faith, but don't believe in Jesus. Like it, faith and Jesus go hand in hand. Um, so if you have faith, you have Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you should have faith. And if you don't, I think you need to reevaluate um, what's going on in your mind and in your spirit. Because um, it's just certain things when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the Christian walk, they go hand in hand. Um, it's just impossible. It, it, I, I don't know how else to say it, but that it's impossible. If you say you have Jesus, but don't have faith or that you have faith, but don't believe in Jesus, it just it doesn't correlate. Um, so you really would have to like really pray about it and figure out what's going on but um it's basically saying that jesus should live in each of you so uh how am i gonna write this hmm. i'm gonna say by faith christ should live within all believers whether you're a new believer, a mature believer, a baby believer, it doesn't matter. Um, so you have John 14.23, Romans 8.9, and then 2 Corinthians 13.5. And then he says, being rooted and grounded in love. So the love of God should be our source. Um, it should be the core and foundation of everything. We should also be rooted in love for one another as Christ was. So 
a big part of the Christian walk, I know we all say it's faith and, and whatnot, but another big part of that is love. Um, and again, love is another one of those things that you can't say you don't have and call yourself a Christian. I mean, Jesus loved everyone. He loved the robber. He loved the prostitute. He loved the killer. I mean, he loved Judas, regardless of what Judas did to him. Like, he loved that man. So, you can't say you're a Christian but don't have love. And I'm not going to say it's easy because, I mean, I I'm struggling loving certain people in my life, <laughs> honestly. Like, I'm, I'm really struggling with that. But I know that I have to love them because that is what is commanded of me. Um, and God is love. So if you don't love, then do you really love God? Do you really have Jesus in your life? It just, it doesn't make sense. Um, but also that, okay, so here it is. Um, so he says being rooted and grounded in love. So the strength of your roots is dependent upon your ability to grasp the depths of God's love for you. You need to be rooted like a plant and grounded like a building on a strong foundation. Hopefully that just makes <laughs> sense. Because <laughs> it makes sense in my head, but saying it out loud now, it sounds weird. But it's kind of um, in a, not an analogy, a metaphor, I guess you would, you could say, of um being rooted and grounded so roots they're they're really down there like they're a tree has really really strong roots and they're really like in the ground and then a building is really grounded on a strong foundation so i, I don't know to me i just thought it was amazing that he says being rooted and grounded in love um and in order for you to be rooted and grounded in that love you have to understand one the depths of god's love for you and um, that your strength, the strength of your roots um, is dependent upon your understanding and ability to get his love for you. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, the love of God should be. our sauce source not sauce <laughs> the love of god should be our source oh sorry that was not in frame so the love of god should be our source um strength of our roots is dependent upon ability to grasp his love to be rooted like a tree and grounded like a building on a strong foundation um like it it should be really hard to move you from the love of God like it really should you know how like if there's like a natural disaster how there are some trees that still stand after those natural disasters it's because their roots are so far deep into the ground that they cannot be moved and the same for a building you know some when you have an earthquake um or would it be considered a tsunami an earthquake a tsunami or a hurricane some buildings will stand untouched and that's because they're truly grounded on strong foundation. That's really how we need to be. And um, again, I struggle with that. I am not going to lie. I, it, it, it's a struggle. It truly is. But that is also the way that I should be living as a daughter of God. Um, it, it, it just You're supposed to be that way. And it, even though it's hard, that's why we are to work towards that consistently every day, every second, every minute. Just It, it needs to be worked on. Um, cause it's, it's hard to call yourself a Christian and you be full of hate. Like it just, it doesn't make sense. I'll never understand going into a church cause all right, my old home church, I, I have two home churches. Um, my first, my very first church, there was always this usher that was just very, very mean. 
you know, all churches have the that one mean usher. And I never understand why those ushers are so mean. You're not supposed to be mean. You're supposed to be loving. You're supposed to be caring, like kind and tender. I, if someone could explain to me why every church, every single church, the ones at least I've been to, there is always that one mean usher. And you're just like, don't you love? Like they're very mean. They tell you what to do with an attitude. It's like they don't like ushering. But if you don't like ushering, I feel like you shouldn't usher. And if you do like ushering and you love God, then what is it with your communication when it comes to the people of God? Like, I don't know. Is it just me or have you guys experienced those type of ushers? I have and I, I just, I don't, I don't know. Maybe they need to um, read verse 17 in Ephesians. I don't know. But um, the cross reference I have for that is going to be Colossians 1 and 23. Sorry, Colossians 1 23 for verse 17. The second part that says being rooted and grounded in love. Um, okay. Then we have verse 18. And I'm just going to underline the whole verse 18 because um, everything I literally just said in verse 17 lines up with uh, verse 18. <laughs> How I said that... Um, you need to be able to grasp the depth of his love. That's basically what verse 18 is saying. So um, it says, have strength to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth. I'm going to underline that. In length, in height, and depth. So we're going to underline all of that. Just all of it. Underline it all. And I'm actually going to write that on the paper. Yeah, I just, I don't understand why they're so mean. I, I I don't. And it's always the old, like, it's like the older they get, they just become mean. And I don't understand. I, I really want to ask. Like, there's been a time when I wanted to ask an usher, like, why she was mean. Because she was really nasty. And it's just like, um, I'll never forget. She was so rude and nasty to this girl who had just came into the church. And she wasn't a Christian. She, you know, she came visiting the church. And the usher was just really mean and nasty towards her. And it made the girl cry like she wanted to walk out of the church. And that's bad when you're supposed to be loving and kind to the people. Especially those who are not Christians, who are not saved. Um, when you're nasty like that, it's, it, it's hard. And that's why a lot of people call Christians hypocrites. Because it just, it, yeah, there's, there's evangelists. There are, some, there are some deacons, too. Oh, my God, there are some deacons out there that will, they, yeah. Just the church as a whole <laughs> needs to understand that. They need to be loving. And for some, some reason, it's hard for a lot of deacons, I realize, and a lot of ushers. I haven't met that many evangelists like that. So that's quite interesting, Tanya. Like, that's really interesting. But yeah, that's really why no one comes. Yep, that's so true, Tanya, because it's not there's not a there's no love in the church. Honestly, there's not um, the church has become a business kind of thing. It's become a fame kind of thing. And I don't think that's, you know, what it's meant to be. Church is not what it used to be back in the day. Like it, it's not church is definitely all about the money, all about the views, all about um, how many people you can get in your church, how big your church is like. That's not what church is meant to be. Um, it's really not. But it's, ter it's like, it's really terrible. But okay. Um, verse 18. So basically it means to come to an understanding of the dimensions of his love by coming to the cross, which points to four ways. So um, the cross points to his love, that his love is wide enough to include everyone. So that means if if a homeless man comes into the church and he smells really bad, don't isolate him. You're not supposed to do that. And I've seen and witnessed people do that like it, it's terrible um and i'm not gonna lie as a kid when i used to see like people coming to the church that weren't of the church i would give them funny looks because one i'm a kid and i'm doing what i see the ushers and the ministers doing um but as i got older i realized that that's not good to do so um you know god's love is um wide enough to include everyone the second thing is that his love is long enough to last all through eternity so it doesn't matter how long you've been a christian how long you've had a relationship with god or christ like it doesn't matter because his love can last through all eternity 
Um, the third thing is that his love is deep enough to reach the worst sinner. Um, I mean, his love reached Judas. His love reached um, the Samaritan woman. His love reached the man that was on the that was hanging on the cross next to him. So, like, it it doesn't matter what the sin is. I mean, sin is sin. He can reach a rapist. He can reach the killer, the thief, the the sex trafficker. Like, he can reach every last one of them um and the fourth thing is that his love is high enough to take us all to heaven we all have access like it's available it's just a matter of you receiving and accepting the access but not everyone does some people are too blinded some people prefer to just live in darkness but um his love is definitely high enough to take us all to heaven if everyone of the earth would agree to it but apparently unfortunately i mean some people don't so um that's basically what all that means when it says uh what is the breadth and length and height and depth um so it's wide enough to include everyone his love is long enough to last through all eternity his love is deep enough to reach the worst sinner and his love is high enough to take us all to heaven so i'm going to write all that down because i know i just said a lot so, um, in the cross reference I have for that is Romans 8 and 39, but, okay, we only got two more verses left to break down. What time is it? It's 11.08, of course. Always an hour and a half. I don't know why I keep saying an hour, <laughs> but, um, so, his love is wide enough. Can you guys see this? Okay, his love is wide enough. To include everyone. Long enough. To last through eternity. Through all eternity, sorry. Deep enough to reach the worst center and high enough to take us all to heaven. <laughs> Tanya, <laughs> the Medea way. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, old school pastors are the best pastors. Um, and there are even some young pastors out there who have like that kind of old school spirit. I know for me, I really enjoy Sarah Jakes. Um, her preaching is really good, and then I also like to watch Pastor Michael Todd on YouTube from Transformation Church, um, because his sermons are really, they have that old school feel, but he's also very real and connects with um, the generation today, so I kind of like his preaching, but um, my old church, I had, my old church, my pastor from that church is still around, he old, um, he's very much old school, and then the church that I go to now, my pastor's not young, but he's not old. But um, he definitely grew up around the church and the church and stuff like that. So I love pastors who have that kind of spirit of um, pure love is what I'm going to call it. They have pure love for God's people. Like, it, I don't know. There's something about the spirit of a pastor, a bishop, uh, a, a speaker, whoever it is, um, that they radiate such love and such purity that just really gets my attention i don't know how to explain it but yeah who tanya um michael todd 
Um, okay, so let's move on to 19. Um, so 19 says, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Awesome, Tanya, awesome. Yeah, my bishop is, they call him an apostle. And my first, like, I don't know. Like, it's, it's Apostle Bishop. I'm still trying to understand the different levels and meanings of, like, the terms. Because, to me, they're going to always be my bishop and my pastor. Like, my pastor, I call her first lady because I'm used to calling her first lady. But I need to get into the habit of calling her pastor. Um, and then my bishop is about to be an apostle. But I don't know. I, uh, I still call him bishop. It's so weird. I need to learn to call them properly like what they are i mean they don't mind it like at all but i don't know i just i need to learn to call them specifically what they are you know if that makes sense but oh yeah michael todd is amazing yeah those pastors that be young with an old soul or the or the older ones that um they act young but still have that old soul i, I just Oh, I don't know. There's something about those kind of pastors. They they speak like the, when they speak, it's just like they have good things to say, good knowledge. But um, okay. So verse 19: To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Um, basically, is that we can truly know the love of Christ if we choose to. It's not speculation or guesswork, and it's not dependent on feelings. Um, you can know His love. Like it, it's. It's there if you want it. You can know it. You have access to it. All you got to do is call out to him, reach out to him, open yourself to it. But a lot of people don't open themselves to it, especially those who find it hard um, to be loved. They choose not to do so. And um, it's really bad. I, I, I feel like um, the church needs to have a revival. Like, honestly, like churches need to do more revivals. And bring people back to the understanding of God's love. Because so many people are heartbroken. So many people are heartbroken. Whether it be in relationships, from family, from church hurt. Like, I, I just feel like people need to understand. Like, truly understand his love for us. Um, so, I'm going to say that. We can know the love. of Christ not speculate guess or depend on feelings I mean his love like I said I mentioned his love already um the width of it the length of it the depth of it and the height of it like it's that powerful, but many people choose not to understand that. Um, they choose to think that once they sin, they can't be forgiven. They they choose to think that once they sin, um, he doesn't love them, and that's not the case at all. And I know for me, I used to think that way. Um, and when you think that way, you stop yourself from going to God, and you run from him, and it just, it never works out when you run, because you, die, you, you take yourself into deeper sin, and then it's more work for him to do, even though he's going to chase you. Like, if you're his chosen, he's going to chase you. There's no getting away from him. But you're making it harder because you're distancing yourself from him and not allowing him to um, give you love. So. That's awesome, Tanya. Um, I just completely <laughs> went blank in my mind. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the next part of verse 19 says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Um, and basically it's saying to experience life in Christ and feel and to be filled, um, to the capacity with him. So I'm going to write that on the post-it note. One thing I want to know, um, Tanya, because I know some people who have, um, 
cross over from being Catholic to Christian, and a lot of the people that I've come across um, in person and also on YouTube, they always say that um, they never really learned to have a relationship with Jesus, like to have a personal relationship. I'm not sure if that's true, but I know that like a lot of the people, like I said, that I watch on YouTube or um, in person, they always say that they never felt that kind of love because they didn't understand um, about having a relationship with Christ. So I'm not sure. I don't know. That's just what I've heard. Is that like a common thing or something? I don't um I just want to know for like personal understanding, but I've heard that a lot from a lot of Catholic people that they just they've never learned in church to have a relationship with Christ. But um okay guys, sorry I went sidetracked. But um verse 19 that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Um, basically to experience a life in Christ and be filled to the capacity with him in Ephesians one twenty three, Okay, Tanya. Because I know a lot of people like that I watch on YouTube, they say that. And I, I've never understood that. Like, I thought it was weird um, that they would say that. So I always wanted to ask somebody that. So, okay. Oh, okay. I get it now. Okay. So it wasn't that it was was it taught it just wasn't as um deep if you will i get it okay now now it's starting on um i'm understanding what they were saying because i definitely was confused when i would hear their videos like huh but okay the way you just said it made a lot of sense thank you um okay and then the last i think this is the last verse that i have to do yeah the last one is verse 20, and I broke this verse into three parts. So, um, it says, To him who is able to do far more, that's one part, and then abundantly than all that we, abundantly than all that we ask or think is another part. And then the final part is according to the power at work within us. So I just broke that one verse into three parts. So I'm just going to have to write those on here to save space. So verse 20 already. Um, so to him who is able to do far more. So God can do any and everything um, we can only do what's possible, but he sets records and he does the impossible. So, God can do all, including the impossible. And the cross-reference for that is going to be Romans sixteen twenty five and Philippians three twenty one. The next part of that verse says abundantly than all that we ask or think. So basically what we can ask or think of is limited, but God is beyond limitations. Um so We are limited, but he is beyond limitations. And cross-reference for that is going to be 1 Corinthians 2.9 and Philippians 4.19. And then lastly... It says, according to the power at work within us. So God is able to do a work in our lives now. We don't have to wait to reach heaven for all he offers unto us. Um, 
everything that we want and desire and need is available like at this moment it's just all about you activating it and i think that's just something that people find it hard to understand because i know for me when i was younger um, especially in college like i didn't understand that all i had to do was pray for it um all i had to do was activate what he already gave me because he gave it all to me by way of the holy spirit the holy spirit is within me he dwells within me christ dwells within me so i have access to the power i just have to activate it but i didn't know that i had to activate it like i thought i just said hey god this is what i need this is what i want do it like that's literally what my thinking was back in college and in high school um so yeah i just it's it's just a matter of us um activating all of that so god is able to do a work in us now don't have to wait and the cross reference is Colossians 1 29 so that is pretty much it what I'm going to do now is um, go back to my notes because I wasn't doing my notes. <laughs> so, 16, I'm going to use this orange. Um, 17, the first part, I use this color. Blue for the second half of that. I'm just going back in with color quickly because I it will bother me if I don't if I don't use the colors now. I didn't mean to go that far. Oopsie. I made an error. That's okay. We'll fix it. Oh, this is just terrible. Okay. I will no longer use these highlighters um, over this gel pen. Because that was not good. But... Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to stick all my sticky notes down. I keep saying I'm going to add paper. I need to actually do that like ASAP. Because um, I'm going to have sticky notes everywhere. But, um. Yeah. We are done for the evening. <laughs> um, it is 11.25. So it took about an hour and a half. Um, so we did chapter three, we will do chapter four next Friday on time at 10 a.m. I'm not going to oversleep and make sure I'm ready. I just, yeah, last night was a very stressful evening for my family and I, so, um, everybody in this house basically overslept. <laughs> Nobody went to, to school or anything, so, but yeah, um, that is it for this do you guys have any questions awesome you did tanya what what are they i definitely would love to know because um i just i don't know i really want to do a video all about good works oh yeah sticky notes are amazing i love sticky. i i have an obsession with sticky notes um every time i see a cute sticky note i have to buy them and I don't really use sticky notes as often as I would like to use them. So I feel like I'm just wasting money. Um, so yeah. <laughs>
But um, do any of you guys have questions before I sign off? Alrighty then, I am going to sign off. Again, I apologize for the lateness of this video. Thanks, Tanya. I'm definitely going to go read those. Um, let me jot those down real quick. Psalms 26, 9 through 11. Matthew 19, 16 to 26. I'm going to go check those out literally right after this. I'm going to do some Bible study. But, um, yeah, I pray you all. Yes, definitely just, just message me. Um, but I pray you all have a good night. It is 11.28. Some of you are probably going to be going to sleep right now. So yeah, <laughs> have a good night and I'll see you guys in the next one.